Ayun. I am Makil Amores, an ICU nurse and a registered respiratory therapist. My topic for this afternoon is intensive care nursing for a patient on a mechanical ventilator. In this lecture, I will be providing you with the basic concepts and ideas about the invasive form of ventilation and the nursing skills healthcare workers need to know when dealing with patients in a ventilator, especially those in the ICU. The objectives of my lecture for this afternoon is to understand the basic concept of mechanical ventilation, to discuss the basic functions of mechanical respirators, and to provide adequate nursing skills on caring for a patient on a mechanical respirator. As we all know, patients who are critically ill and need oxygen support are usually attached to a mechanical ventilator. That's why nurses who are assigned in the intensive or critical care unit should be competent in caring for patients with mechanical ventilator. Though there are some technicalities that a nurse should consider, in this lecture, we will be learning about this in a nutshell. Let me share this to you. It states here the role of nurses in caring for a patient hooked to a mechanical ventilator. So let's define first what is a ventilator. It is a machine that mechanically assists a patient in the exchange of oxygen and carbon dioxide, a process sometimes referred to as artificial respiration. It is a way to support the respiratory system until the underlying cause of respiratory failure has been resolved. This machine might be very intimidating at first to a new nurse in the ICU or new nurse in general, and that is why I am here to give you basic knowledge about this machine. Others may call it MECVENT, short for mechanical ventilators, respirator or ventilator, or even breathing machine. They are all the same. But don't be confused sometimes, since respirator is what we call with a mask we healthcare workers wear in the COVID unit. So what are the uses and benefits of mechanical respiration? To deliver oxygen and eliminate carbon dioxide, to ease the work of breathing, it also treats hypoxemia and the respiratory acidosis which is based from our arterial blood gas, the relief of respiratory muscle, and it also prevents and reverses atelectasis. So what are the useful indications when a patient is being hooked to a mechanical ventilator? The first one is the absence of breathing. Next is the respiratory distress or muscle fatigue. The clinically apparent is increasing work of breathing and relieved by other interventions. Say for example, our patient is already hooked to a non-invasive form of ventilation, which is, say, for example, high-flow oxygen or BiPAP or CPAP, and still we cannot see any improvement. The patient is still desaturated, so we can already recommend the patient to be intubated and hooked to a respirator. Severe circulatory shock, neuromuscular disease such as the GBS and the myasthenia gravis, and cardiopulmonary arrest. So I have divided my lecture into 13 care essentials for patients hooked to a ventilator. So let's begin first with the effective communication. As we all know, communication among care providers promotes optimal outcomes. For mechanically ventilated patients, care providers may include the primary care physicians, the pulmonologist, the hospitalist, the intensive care and the critical care team, our respiratory therapist, the pharmacist, even the nutritionist, the PTs and the OTs, and especially as nurses. And to make sure that we are aware of the other team members' communications about the patient, we must find out the goals of therapy for our patient when obtaining a report or when making a nursing care plan. We may ask, why is she on a ventilator? Is it to improve oxygen, to boost ventilation, to permit sedation? or most probably to reverse respiratory muscle fatigue. Why is the patient on our unit? Why is the patient in ICU? Maybe because there is an underlying condition that complicates weaning from the ventilator. What is the DNR status of our patients? All of this should be well communicated and well understood by all members of the healthcare team. Communicating with the patient is also essential. Provide writing tools or a communication board so that the patient can express their needs. Ask a simple yes or no questions to which our patients can nod or shake. Call button must always be readily available in case the patient needs you or has something to ask or communicate. 
explanation of procedure every time the patient or every time a procedure is being done helps reduce anxiety. The second one is ventilator settings, modes, and alarms. This is one of the hardest part for some nurses since majority of our nurses are unaware of the machine. They do not know how to operate and even look at the monitor of the respirator. That is why it is important that the first days of nurses in the unit, they may be oriented with the machines and equipment being used. It is also important that when we enter the patient's room, we take the vital signs, we check the oxygen saturation, we listen to the breath sounds, and we also note changes from the previous findings. We also assess the patient's pain and anxiety levels. We must also read the patient's order and obtain information about the type of ventilator being used. We must also compare the current ventilator settings with the settings prescribed in the order sheet. We must familiarize ourselves also with the ventilator alarms and the actions that we need to take when an alarm sounds. We must locate suction equipment and review its use. Look for a bag valve mask, which should always be available for every patient with an artificial airway. We must know how to hyperventilate and hyperoxygenate our patient. We have divided it into the volume cycled mode and the pressure cycled mode. The first one is the volume cycled, which guarantees volume at expense of letting airway pressure vary. Once preset volume is delivered to the patient, the ventilator cycles off and exhalation occurs passively. Under this one, we have the CMV mode or the controlled mechanical ventilation where in set tidal volume at a set rate is given. This is commonly used for patients who cannot initiate their own breathing. The AC mode or the assist control mode provides full ventilator support to the patient. A set tidal volume is delivered at a minimum rate. Additional ventilator breaths are given if triggered by the patient. The next one is the SIMV mode or the synchronized intermittent mandat mandatory ventilation. Breaths are given at a set minimal rate, but if the patient chooses to breathe over the set rate, no additional support is given. One advantage of the SIMV is that it allows patients to breathe on their own. SIMV is usually associated with greater work of breathing than AC ventilation, and therefore, is less frequently used as the initial ventilator mode. Like AC, SIMV can deliver set tidal volumes or a set pressure and time. Negative inspiratory pressure generated by spontaneous breathing leads to increased venous return, which theoretically may help cardiac output and function. The next one is the pressure cycle ventilator, which guarantees pressure at expense of letting tidal volume vary. Inspiration is also terminated when per set pressure reached. Volume is variable and determined by set pressure level, airway resistance, and lung compliance factors, specified time or flow cycling criteria. Under this, we have the PSV or the pressure support ventilation, wherein the patient controls the respiratory rate and exerts a major influence on the duration of inspiration, inspiratory flow rate, and tidal volume. The model provides pressure support to overcome the increased work of breathing imposed by the disease process, the AT tube, the inspiratory valves, and other mechanical aspects of ventilatory support. So let's define the different basic ventilator settings. We have the tidal volume, the FiO2, the backup rate, the PEEP, the peak flow rate, and the sensitivity. So the tidal volume is the air that the client receives per breathing. It is usually computed based from the ideal body weight of the patient. The fraction of inspired oxygen, or the FiO2, is the oxygen concentration delivered to the client. ABG is usually determined before adjusting FiO2 levels. Remember that room air is 21% and the highest possible FiO2 is 100%. Peak flow rate is the maximum flow delivered by the ventilator during inspiration. Peak flow rates of 60 liters per minute may be sufficient, although higher rates are frequently necessary. The backup rate is the amount of breath given every minute 
to the patient. The PEEP or the positive end expiratory pressure is exerted during the expiration phase of ventilation, which improves oxygenation by enhancing gas exchange and preventing atelectasis. A typical initial applied PEEP of 5 cm water. However, a PEEP of up to 20 cm water may be used in patients undergoing low tidal volume ventilation for acute respiratory distress syndrome or the ARDS. The sensitivity, it is used to describe the ventilator's responsiveness to the patient's breathing effort. Sensitivity adjusts the level of negative pressure required to trigger the ventilator. With assisted ventilation, the sensitivity typically is set at negative 1 to negative 2 cm water. So what are the ventilator alarms? Ventilator offers audible and visual alarms to alert the caregiver about the patient's condition and ventilator functions and settings. These alarms prompt a timely response, safeguarding the patient and proper functioning of the ventilator. Alarms are designed to warn nurses that there is something wrong either to the patient or to the mechanical ventilator. But sometimes, alarms can give nurses apprehensions, especially if the alarm is non-stop and we do not know how to troubleshoot the problem. This is the time that we already ask help from our colleagues or from the respiratory therapist on G. So as a nurse, how will you manage if there's an alarm? First, assess the patient if he or she is in distress. Identify the alarm, whether high pressure or low pressure. Some mechanical ventilators have their own indicators and show the cause of the alarm. So it is important to check your machine as well. Note that it is critical that whenever an alarm occurs, the caregiver evaluates the patient first before checking the ventilator. So with a low pressure alarm, it may indicate leak in the patient's tube, disconnection of the tube, or the patient stops to breathe. So what are we going to do if we can see this alarm? The first one is check the tube connections. Reconnect the patient to the ventilator if necessary. Auscultate patient's lung fields for bilateral lung sounds. Monitor the respiratory rate and breathing patterns and evaluate cough pressure and reinflate if needed. For high pressure alarm, this may indicate displacement of the AT tube, increased secretions, obstruction in the tube, bronchospasms, and the patient is coughing or biting the tube. So what are we going to do if we see high pressure alarm? The first is always assess the patient. Auscultate lung fields for secretions. Suction secretion as needed. If the patient is biting the tube, provide bite block or insert the OPA or the oral pharyngeal airway. You can also sedate patient if necessary, especially when the patient is fighting the ventilator. Make sure that it is ordered by the attending physician or the resident on duty. And also, monitor pulse oximeter continuously if cardiac monitor and pulse oximeter devices are present. The third care essential is suction appropriate. Suction only as needed, not according to a schedule. Although specific airway management guidelines exist, always check your facilities policy and procedure manual. General suctioning recommendations include the following. Hyperoxygenate the patient before and after suctioning to help prevent oxygen desaturation. Do not instill normal saline solution into the ET tube in an attempt to promote secretion removal. We must also limit suctioning pressure to the lowest level needed to remove secretion and suction for the shortest duration possible. If our patient has an ET tube, check for tube slippage into the right mainstem bronchus through an X-ray, as well as in advertent extubation. Other complications of tracheostomy tube include tube dislodgement, bleeding, and infection. To identify these complications, assess the tube insertion site, the breath sounds, the vital signs, and even the PIP trends in the mechanical ventilator. And if our patient has a tracheostomy, perform routine cleaning and care according to facility policies and procedure. The fourth one is assess pain and sedation needs. Even though your patient cannot verbally express their needs, you need to assess the pain level using a reliable scale. Keep in mind that a patient's acknowledgement of pain 
means pain is really present and must be treated. One scale that helps us evaluate our patient's sedation level is the Richmond Agitation Sedation Scale or the RAS. Another one is also the CCPOT or the Critical Care Pain Observation Tool wherein we check the facial expression, body movements, muscle tension, compliance with the ventilator, and the vocalization of our patients. One question that is frequently asked is, should we restrain an agitated ventilator patient to prevent extubation? Research shows that self-extubation can occur despite physical restraints. It is best to treat agitation and anxiety with medication and non-pharmacologic methods, such as communication, touch, presence of family members, music, guided imagery, and distraction. The fourth care essential is prevent infection. As we all know, ventilator-associated pneumonia or the VAP is a major complication of mechanical ventilator. And much research has focused on how best to prevent VAP. The Institute for Healthcare Improvement includes the following components in its best practices VAP prevention bundle. The best way is always to prevent cross-contamination of any disease is a strict hand washing. Nurses should always perform oral care to patient attached to mechanical ventilator. We must know the hospital policies regarding the standard oral hygiene procedures. We must also change the closed suction system at least every 72 hours or as indicated or needed. We must also apply cream or ointment to bony prominences or as indicated by the physician. Assess patient daily for extubation readiness. Early extubation can greatly prevent VAP. We must also provide peptic ulcer disease prophylaxis as with a histamine 2 blocker such as famotidine. Provide deep vein thrombosis prophylaxis. Other measures that decrease VAP risk include extubating the patient as quickly as possible, performing range of motion exercises, and patient turning and positioning to prevent the effects of muscle disuse, having the patient sit up when possible to improve gas exchange, and providing appropriate nutrition to prevent a catabolic state. We must also assess the patient's tolerance when they perform an activity by checking the vital signs, oxygen status, and pain and agitation levels. Keeping bacteria out of the oral secretions also reduce the VAP risk. Use an endotracheal tube with a suction lumen above the AT cuff to allow continuous suctioning of tracheal secretions that accumulate in the subglottic area. Do not routinely change the ventilator circuit or tubings. Check for hospital policy on changing a ventilator circuit. We must also brush the patient's teeth, patient's teeth at least twice a day and provide oral moisturizers every two to four hours. The fifth one is prevent hemodynamic instability. We must monitor the patient's blood pressure every hour, especially after ventilator settings are changed or adjusted. Mechanical ventilation causes thoracic cavity pressure to rise on inspiration which puts pressure on blood vessels and may reduce blood flow to the heart. As a result, blood pressure may drop. To maintain hemodynamic stability, you may need to increase IV fluids or administer a drug such as norepinephrine if ordered. We must also check for any changes in the ECG tracings and rhythm. The seventh one is manage the airway. The cough of the endotracheal or tracheostomy tube provides airway occlusion. Proper cough inflation ensures the patient receives the proper ventilation parameters such as the tidal volume and the oxygenation. Following the hospital policy, inflate the cough and measure per proper inflation pressure using the ET cough manometer. These techniques help prevent tracheal irritation and damage caused by high, high cough pressure. Always practice them with an experienced nurse or respiratory therapist on duty. Never add air to the cough without using proper technique. The normal is 20 to 30 cm water cough pressure. With assistance from an experienced colleague, change the tracheostomy tube or tracheostomy tie and endotracheal tube securing devices if they become solid or loose. Incorrect technique could cause accidental extubation. We must also position the ventilator tubings properly, not in a way that it pulls the AT tube already. 
we must also document the AT tube level and always assess it if it may get dislodged, especially when the patient is agitated. The eighth care essential is meet the patient's nutritional needs. For optimal outcomes, ventilator patients must be well nourished and should begin taking nutrition early. But like any patient who cannot swallow normally, they need an alternative nutrition route. Preferably, they should have feeding tubes like NGT with liquid nutrition provided through it. If this isn't possible, the healthcare team will consider parenteral nutrition. Patients with tracheostomy tubes may be able to swallow food. However, we must follow the physician's orders and consult speech and respiratory therapists regarding the matter. We must also assess the daily caloric requirement based on the labs, the intake and output of our patients, and the patient's nutritional need. The ninth one is to wean the patient from the ventilator appropriately. As your patient's indications for mechanical ventilation is being resolved and she's able to take more breaths of her own, the healthcare team will consider removing the patient from the ventilator. Weaning methods may vary by facility and provider preferences. Although protocols may be used to guide ventilator withdrawal, the best methods involve teamwork, consistent evaluation of our patient, and adjustment based on these changes. Diagnostic tests such as the APG, X-ray, spontaneous breathing trial is done to check readiness for extubation. Some patients may need weeks of gradually reduced ventilator assistance before they can be extubated. Others can be weaned at all. Factors that affect ease of weaning include underlying disease process such as chronic obstructive pulmonary disease or peripheral vascular disease medications used to treat anxiety and pain, and the nutritional stock. And when we are ready to extubate the patient, we must have the supplies ready at our bedside. We have, the, we have the bug valve mask, the oxygen, the nasal cannula or the face mask, or even the BiPAP, the suction setup, the high flow oxygen, or what our attending physician prefers. The 10th care essential is elimination care. Hourly draining of urine and change of Foley catheter should be routinely done. Routine checking of a diaper for stool and immediate change of diaper when sold must be observed. It is also recommended to change the diaper every shift and when sold. For the 11th care essential, the optimal level of mobility. The passive range of motion should be done every six to eight hours to avoid contractures and venous stasis. It is also recommended that a patient is being referred to the rehab medicine for physical therapy and start of simple exercises. For the 12th care essential, the promotion of safety and security. We must also maintain that side rails are always raised and bed is always locked to avoid accidents, whether our patient is GCS3, GCS11, or GCS15. Call buttons should always be made available at the bed of our patients. Provide environment that is calm and quiet. Adequate lighting and ventilation should always be considered. We must ask the patient regarding their preferences of the temperature of the aircon. And the last one is educate the patient and family. Seeing a loved one attached to a mechanical ventilator is frightening. And to ease distress in the patient and the family, teach them why mechanical ventilation is needed and emphasize the positive outcomes it can provide. Each time you enter the patient's room, explain what we are doing. Reinforce the need and reason for multiple assessment and procedures, such as laboratory tests, x-ray, and ABG. Communicate desired outcomes and progression toward outcomes so that the patient and family can actively participate in the plan of care. Caring for a patient on mechanical ventilation requires teamwork, knowledge of care goals, and interventions based on best practices, patient needs, and response to therapy. Mechanical ventilation has become a common treatment, and nurses must be knowledgeable and confident when caring for ventilator patients. And that ends my lecture. Here are the references.
Thank you very much and have a good day.